Hello and welcome to a new episode here on the Warf's Rebellion podcast for Age Civil War. Today we are meeting some stereotypes and be Irish. I hope you have your Guinness ready for today's episode because we are going to talk about the Emerald Island. And joining me today is Patrick O'Malley. He is professor of of English. I have to watch myself here, one of my newest directions. He is a professor of English at Georgetown University. He has a PhD from Harvard in English language and literature. He also has published Catholicism, Sexual Deviance, and Victorian Gothic Culture. Sounds very interesting. And we're just going to immediately here get to his newest book which is published by the university of virginia press the irish and the imagining imagination the irish and the imagination of race white supremacy across the atlantic in 19 in the 19th century which came out late last year uh, but first of all, thank you so much, Patrick, for joining me here today on this, on the podcast. And um, I don't think either one of us has a Guinness. Not yet today. But, not yet, but maybe by the end we we can celebrate together. Ah, I'm, we'll uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really uh, delighted to to be here and to chat with you about the book. Um, I'm also pretty excited about. Uh, being interviewed by a historian um, and grateful to you for for inviting a a lit guy um in into the into the conversation yeah. so uh, thank you very much for that and uh, my pleasure I'm forward to our to our talk yeah my pleasure it's 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 something that hnet has been talking about for a while to breach out and i think when when it comes to history and literature we're we're very close to each other and in many ways after all so but before we get into like what you do specifically professionally here with literature tell us about how did you get interested in the irish you mentioned before we we talked that you had like this childhood brief stay in scotland was that sort of something that got you or like how 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 did you get interested in the irish well, um, my name is Patrick O'Malley, uh, and so that is a way in which, um, I, but I'm American. Um, I was Ooh. I was born in the United States. I was born in New York City, and, and but I think that my name has always, in a way, um, created various kinds of preconceptions in other people about mm -hmm. about about me and 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 who I am and where I'm from. So. Um, it's, uh, it's been something, um, Irishness has been, been something that's been pretty, pretty interesting, uh, to me. And that I've been interested in from, for my whole life. I have family in Ireland, um, mostly in the West of Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, that we visited when, when I was, when I was a kid, I think this, um, this particular project, uh, in a, in a way, emerged out of my previous book, which is actually the book um, after after the one that you mentioned um, about Catholicism, sexual deviance uh, in Victorian Gothic culture. When in one thing that I found is that in my work, I guess each each book after the first has been in a way a kind of, return to and wrestling with okay. some problem that was manifested in the previous book mm -hmm. uh, and that I dealt with in some kind of way, but that I wasn't really satisfied with. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, after uh, Catholicism, um, Sexual Deviance in Victorian Gothic Culture, uh, which was a book about the uses of gothic imagery and gothic language most um, throughout through the 19th century actually but especially uh in the second half of the of the 19th century i got pretty interested in the question of why so many of the writers i was writing about uh were irish protestants mm 
And um, in this goes back to uh, one of the one of the books that's been a re recurring book in almost everything I've written, um, which is a book called Melmoth the Wanderer by by the Irish uh, Church of Ireland minister Charles uh, Robert Maturin, uh, who was. Um, who was Oscar Wilde's uncle by marriage. So there's a really interesting kind of connection there oh. across the century. Um, but but um, in 1820, he publishes um, what becomes a kind of kind of standard iconic book um, of, of Gothic called, called Memoth the Wanderer. So there's him uh, later in the century, Diane Busico uh, publishes um, a, a play called The Vampire or The Phantom uh, that I was sort of glancingly interested in um, in in uh, Catholicism, sexual deviance, and Victorian Gothic culture, and um, but but also um, around 1870, Sheridan Le Fanu, another Irish Protestant writer, mm -hmm. uh, uh, writes a um, I mean a series of kind of Gothic uh, short short stories, um, but also also one uh, called Carmilla. Um, which has sometimes been uh, identified as the first lesbian vampire story, uh, and um, and that was uh, pretty well known um, and and pretty pretty influential. And then, of course, at the end of the century, uh, in in the eighteen nineties, there is uh, Oscar Wilde himself with the picture of Dorian Gray and Bram Stoker with Dracula. Uh, mm -hmm. All of these Irish Protestant writers were becoming major figures in this first book. And um, I, I tried to think about why that might be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a I had a bit of an answer, right, about the divided self and mm -hmm. um and 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 about sort of like the conflicts of kind of like doubleness, right? And and mm -hmm. sort of like du dual allegiances um in in that in that first book as as well as the the kind of like the gothic -y question of the like the return of the repressed right like mm -hmm. historical violence coming coming back in in various ways um but i wasn't really satisfied with it and i i wanted to think more about it and so the second book um which is um titled um Liffey and Lethe paramnesiac history in 19th century anglo ireland uh I'm glad was you said that it was actually <laughs> Uh, a sort of study of of the uh, of how to account for um, kind of like unresolved historical violence um, in oh. Irish literature and oh. and especially in Irish historiography of yeah. the of the nineteenth century oh. um, and and so it was a way of kind of like coming back to this question of like why are all these Gothic right, writer, yeah. you know these uh, uh, Irish Protestants, um, but to take to take history a little bit more seriously and to think about mm -hmm. the ways that they're actually thinking about history, um, yeah. but also thinking about a kind of mismatch mm -hmm. between the sort of unresolved wounds of Irish mm -hmm. history. And mm -hmm. generic conventions, which literary generic conventions, which try to, in in some ways, kind of um, uh, create, you know, kind of pressure towards closure, mm -hmm. towards like yeah. having a story yeah. that has a beginning, a middle, and end. And what does it mean to be writing those kinds of stories if you are, especially if you're writing about history and historical events, mm -hmm. if you're living in a period which doesn't understand its history as closed, right? right? And 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 how how does that work? So that so that's what that book became. Um and I realize this is now a very long uh answer <laughs> to your question about how this third book came about. Um but what actually happened was that I had a kind of um in in that book in in uh Liffey and Lethe, uh, I had a, a chapter on vampires um, and vampires oh. in relationship to the famine, um, um, and and the, the the ways in which certain kinds of representations of vampire hunger, right, might be might be related to representations both literary but then also journalistic of um, of starving Irish people, um, especially in the west of Ireland, as as skeletons mm. or. Or otherwise, mm -hmm. kind of undead, um, living living on. Mm 
And um, oh. and so there was a there's a cha chap that chapter brought together uh, share again Sheridan Le Fanu's uh, Carmilla um, with Diane Boussico's, uh Vampire. And I had a kind of throwaway line there um, about John Mitchell, uh, oh. <laughs> the 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 Irish uh, sort of seditionist um, yeah, and yeah. Um, and and um, and nationalist and transportee um, and um, and activist in oh. in all kinds of ways. Uh, I had a sort of throwaway line there um about him in in relationship to Busica. but i i got kind of like super interested uh in and started going down a kind of rabbit hole of these these odd um parallels between mitchell and Busica. um as they as they as they traveled and especially in the United States in the 1850s um and and so they're both Irish Protestant writers um they're uh, from different parts of Ireland um and, and different types of Protestantism um but uh, but both Irish Pro Protestant writers um both writers who who have real significance both in in Ireland and in um what they do in the United States um they they both arrive in New York City I mean in complicated ways I mean it's easier for Busica Busica just goes uh Mitchell is is first transported yeah. to as you know right to the, yeah it's a bit longer journey for you journey right um and then and and ends up on the west coast and then comes across but um they it both took arrive a long way around it's so. a long way around right <laughs> um, but they both arrive in New York City in the last months of 1853 um mm -hmm. so they're both kind of like getting there at the same same time um mm -hmm. in in 1855 um Busico temporarily uh moves to um the the um enslaving state of Louisiana um Mitchell becomes a farmer in the enslaving state of Tennessee um, in 1858, they're both in Washington D.C., which is my home um, and and where where wow. my uh, what, where where my academic institution is. Uh, they're they're both they're both here in 1858. Um, they're both back in New York uh, in overlapping ways um, in mm -hmm. the 1870s. They they both write about um, American. Um, enslavement of people of African descent, although incredibly different ways, and and that was what that was this that was the knot um, that I that I that I was coming back to as I was going down this mm -hmm. kind of like rabbit hole of of like trying to figure out you know where were they living in you know eighteen fifty eight and 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 you know how how did they overlap um, was why does Busico uh, why does Busico write about race and enslavement in the context of the United States in the way that he does um, mm -hmm. in, in, in and, and why does Mitchell write about it in the way that he does, mm. even while, um, I mean, especially for Mitchell, um, more complicated for Busico, um, wow. we could think of them both as, as sort of literary nationalists um, mm -hmm. within the Irish context. Yeah. Um, and And so... So this this became a kind of like persistent sort of like question for me, a kind of like this mm -hmm. thing that I was turning over um, in in my mind. And of course, part of it is their own, you know, who they are as people, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely that's definitely part of it. Um, their background, um, their um, you, you know how how they come to the questions, right? You know, the, the, mm. you, you you can't discount the the absolutely personal, um, yeah. But but I also and this is you know why I think I as a kind of lit person um, came to this. I started to think about it as also a question of genre, mm -hmm. um, and 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 we can talk a little bit more about the way the genre works in the book. But um, but but I started to think about it that it what it's not just. Um, that Mitchell chooses to write about race and 
and American and the American enslavement of people of African descent um, in the form of the polemical tract and okay. and Busico does it in the in the form of the stage melodrama. I mean, that's where they come from, right? Uh-huh. And so that's the genres right. that they're that they're using. Um, but I started to I started to think about the ways in which those genres actually also shape the way they think about these questions right so the mm-hmm. so so that the genres aren't just reflections of the thought which came first mm-hmm. right and the clothes in which the thought that came first you know puts on yeah. um but but the, the genre, chicken and egg situation chicken and egg right? situation right and and this went back to the kind of question in a way that i was asking in my in my second book which was sort of like how how do you know how when you're when you're writing um, a historical novel, say, uh-huh. right? You know how how does the fact that it's a historical novel and not history right. affect the way that you think about the relationship of the past to the present, right? right. Yeah. Um, you know, not not only that. Oh, hey, I want I'm the kind of person who writes historical novels, but <laughs> as opposed to history, right? But yeah. but that it yeah. you start to think about. Um, the arc of history in different kinds of ways, uh-huh. right? Because because the genres have various kinds of expectations that you're writing with, but you're also uh-huh. writing against, um, that yeah. you're thinking about, that you're thinking with. If you're if you're Busico and you're um and you need to sell tickets to a play, that's a really <laughs> different kind of uh-huh. sort of like gen- generic imperative than someone like Mitchell, who is kind of like opening uh-huh. up his own presses to like publish his his newspapers. Um right. so um so I started to think about genre in that way and then started to think, oh wow, these genres are actually really interesting. And there's there's sort of a series of them. Um yeah. that that a series of of kind of generic forms or modal forms mm-hmm. in which uh some of these Irish nationalists writers take on the kind of question of 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 race and and american enslavement and 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 forms of the political polemic and the um this the stage melodrama but but also uh forms like the gothic and 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 the bardic uh po- poem and and the national tale yeah. so that became the heart of this of this new project yeah well <laughs> That's a that is a long story, but it's yeah, a, yeah it's sorry an about the long story. story <laughs> <to> kind of, <laughs> like I mean, it's always the case, right? Sometimes we have these moments where it's like, ooh, there's this unanswered question or something we didn't have the ability to flesh out in our first or second or third book, and we go back to it in some form. Um, but one thing I want to like before we get more into the into the book and the subject matter, I wanted to kind of give you a chance to talk about it as well because. Like very early on in the correspondence to set this up, you kind of pointed out nicely and kind of was a little concerned that you're not a historian, but you are a literary a literary critic. So mm-hmm. what does that mean? <laughs> Let's start with that. Like, what does it mean? What like maybe how do you approach your sources differently? Or how do you approach the subject? And how do you then take like like a book like a book by John Mitchell or uh, Budico and what, how do you read it? Yeah. Um, I think this is a really interesting question. And um, one of the things that I'm, that I have the sort of privilege and honor to do at Georgetown over the past uh, several years, actually is, is co-teach a, a class with a colleague who's a historian um, and the and the class um, is actually focused on the 18th century okay. rather than the 19th, um, but it's under the rubric in the College of Arts and Sciences uh, um, at Georgetown. It's a first year seminar, mm-hmm. um, and it's un- and under the rubric of what's called ways of knowing. And one of the um, the kind of uh, fundamental questions or animating questions of the class, even as we're teaching together we're always mm-hmm. in the classroom together with, with students together um mm-hmm. we're reading we're reading the same works mm-hmm. um is is what are the different what are the different ways in which uh someone who's trained as a historian mm-hmm. um might might approach the same 
let's say a work of literature uh, in a different way than someone who's uh, trained as a liter as a literary critic, oh, yeah. and and also how yeah. how would a literary critic maybe maybe similarly or maybe in a different way a, approach some kind of archival document, right? Yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Um, a, a, a letter or a um, or 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 you know, a polemical tract or a, yeah. a medical journal or, yeah, you know, or any, anything else, a pamphlet or, you yeah. know, anything else that we, that we might, um, that we might find, because it's, it's certainly the, the case um, that uh, a lot of historians, right. Um, you well, know, engage with literature, right. And, right. and do so in really, really wonderful. Um, and I, and I think yeah. enlightening and revelatory ways. Um, and uh, at least for, you know, quite quite a while now. I mean, the the, the sort of question of of historical context, um, uh, other you know, sort of like archival or historical documents have been uh, have been important to at least um, many uh, sort of strands of literary study. Although, cert although certainly not all. So, so there's a lot mm -hmm. of ways in which we're reading the same stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I I and I don't want to um I don't want to over overstate the the differences except as a kind of um as a sort of apology from from the beginning that <laughs> that uh that I you know I'm sort of in awe of the things that historians know um and and and, and keep in their minds at, <laughs> at at all points that that I that I always find uh, more difficult um but I, I think that there, um, that this isn't necessarily a difference, but it's a kind mm -hmm. of, it's, it's a sort of, um, a sort of degree of emphasis. Um, mm -hmm. And that from, I'd say that, <clears throat> that one way in which there are, there, there are kind of like methodological um, ranges mm -hmm. is that when I approach literary texts, even though I'm really interested in their relationship to the historical, um, I'm, I'm interested in that. And, and again, many historians are, of course, as well, not only as a symptom of the history, right, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that there's some kind of like historical event, a war, right, right? or, or, a, a, or a migration, or a famine, mm -hmm. or, um, right. or, uh, no, or, not just readings them as sort of like a, a an yeah, account the, of this an period. account of this period, mm -hmm. or even symptomatic of the, of yeah. the period, right, which, which absolutely they can be, yeah. right? But also as shaping the way in which people in the period thought, the kind mm -hmm. of the, the the kinds of kind of like it, it the the literature and literature broadly here provided a kind of um various kinds of of forms. Mm -hmm. of thought about things that are happening in in mm -hmm. the world right and um in in literary studies i mean like one of the oh this isn't the subject of this this book but one of the ways in which uh literary critics have been really interested in that is, is thinking about for example uh gender relationships or or mm -hmm. or kind of like you know, um in the in the 18th century and coming into the 19th century and and sort of sort of thinking about a, a you know, a writer, an incredibly influential writer, or someone like Jane Austen, uh, as not only um, reflecting uh -huh. kind of like understandings of gender relations at the at the turn of the nineteenth century, but also providing a kind of grammar for gender relations going forward mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. she that that her novels in a way shape the way that we think about what love is not right. only yeah. not only reflecting right so the changes yeah. of what love is right so that's yeah. so that's one of the ways so that's you know not not you know part of this book but but that that kind of question and that's why um so I'm as a as a literature guy, right? Um, I'm I'm really interested in thinking about the work that literary form mm -hmm. does, mm 
Yeah. Uh, right. The cultural work yeah. that literary form it, itself uh, does. Right. So um, sort of like why why is a book a bestseller and how does why why do school kids have to keep reading this this book forever sure, and ever right, right? yeah it's, right it shapes it's sh sort of like it's shaped by the by a generation but it then shapes another generation it absolutely shapes another generation and in yeah. in some some kind of like deep and mm -hmm. kind of complicated way it shapes what we understand as truth right yeah. it shapes as we yeah. understand as kind of like the the true and the meaningful right mm -hmm. um and oh, yeah. so um so so at first so so at first when i was working on this book i was mm -hmm. kind of thinking about genre in a in a in a relatively schematic way i i mm -hmm. have to say that is i was i was actually sort of, i was thinking about okay we've got these you know, let, let me think, let me think about a Gothic novel or a Gothic right, right. kind of like tale or, or a realist novel or something like that, that, mm -hmm. that is, is about um, America and, and race and enslavement. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I was, and I was particularly interested in genres that had been important in the early part of the 19th century and also in the late 18th century to Irish nationalist aspiration, mm -hmm. right? So I was really interested in genres that that kind of had become kind of iconic mm -hmm. Irish nationalist right. genres mm -hmm. um, in, in some way or other. And then, and then I was kind of interested in tracing the ways in which they either did or, or didn't mm -hmm. um, um, effectively translate this kind of liberationist conviction into the context of American race-based chattel enslavement and the right. white supremacy that both subtended right. it and, and outlived yeah. it. Um, so that was a kind of literal and literary understanding of genre and its relevance to 19th century understandings of race. But as I was working on the book, I, I realized that there was a second and and probably more important way in which genre and race speak to each other and and that's that they both name these culturally and ideologically inflected mm -hmm. categories right. um they're both constructed categories by which i mm -hmm. mean that they're not um they're, they're not essential Right. They, mm -hmm. they don't they don't they, they don't precede the discourse about them. Right. Okay. But are produced by the and through the discourse mm -hmm. about them. Um, mm -hmm. But they also, even as they're. Constructed, um, they really deeply they're deeply influential on the mm -hmm. on the way that we understand the world around us. Right, they are they are stories that become mm -hmm. truth in various kinds of ways for yeah. the way that we see the right around us. So they they articulate and enforce mm -hmm. at the same time really powerful forms of relationality. Yeah. And so, um, so this became really interesting to me, right? Because I started to think like, well, this is so so like there there's literary genre um, in in um, in this important way, and the, the and also race. Is relational in a in a kind of way that's that's sort of like um, um, so similar um, to and to to this kind of this sort of like generic um, understanding. And here's where um, I mean there were there were a number of really important uh, scholars of color, especially um, who helped me sort of like think wow. about this this relationship. Um, people like um, Yogita uh, Goyal and Brigitte Fielder and and Mark Jung um, mm -hmm. really uh, helped me kind of like who've written about this um, right. and and kind of like often coming to the question from a from a kind of literary background and and sort of like thinking mm -hmm. about the ways in which form um, really really matters to to productions of of race. Um, so so that so so that's really sort of like how I. Um, came to think that that both genre in a, in a kind of um um you know almost in a kind of in this kind of schematic way mm -hmm. right there are particular genres that I'm interested in tracing right. um mattered here um and I come to the genres as a as a literary critic but also thinking about um 
kind of like the the the, the forces of form and the way that um, the, the way that that the kind of imperatives of category work on our minds mm -hmm. sometimes in some kind of um, damaging ways, right? And mm -hmm. and that I wanted to both understand um, in in the nineteenth century and its aftermath, which I think is continuing today. Um, and, uh, right. And, and, yeah, and also to maybe try to name and, and ideally disrupt. Yeah. Now I, I kind of, when you were talking, I wonder, it's sort of like when you talk about these genres and authors that are in these genres, um, are these genres that the author would have been like, I am part of this or was I kind of just they had read people that wrote something similar and they kind of adopted that style and we later like attached sort of a genre to, or later literature literary critics attached a genre to them um would they have been kind of like educated by like like kind of thinking of like like a like a person that goes to a certain school and there's this this big critic and that's sort of their upbringing so they kind of follow that that kind of like style or do they kind of like like how did they come to the <laughs> to these styles yeah, yeah. to these genres I mean, I mean that's the yeah right i mean i it's sometimes sometimes very very specifically um and um and and sometimes mm -hmm. more um is sort of like the you know the air that they breathe right. right in a way right i mean there there's a there's a way in which um you know if i if i mention some some sort of genre right like like the um you know the western or something like that for right, yeah. for yeah. right for for film all right yeah. um you know there's things we all we have don't an image in mind <laughs> we all have an image in mind right and we yeah. don't necessarily have to have taken a class on the western but mm -hmm. we've some we've somehow it's it's somehow and we we can even start to recognize ways in which a kind of mode of the western can mm -hmm. show up in films that aren't westerns Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in science fiction, for example, we could say, hey, you know, there's that is drawing on a kind of tradition, uh, maybe consciously, maybe, you know, not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but some of them, I'd say, are um, are are are, in fact, um, you know, specific. There are there are mm -hmm. writers that are that is and I, and I try to draw that out in, in some ways in the book. So so, for example, um someone someone like Edgar Allan Poe who I who I write about um uh in a in a chapter of the book uh was was not only really interested in um certain kinds of of Irish literature and in particular the um the the poet um uh, Thomas More um who became one of the most um most read uh, mm -hmm. Irish Irish poets in, in oh, the yeah. United States yeah. um in the in their you know in the 19th century uh but but Poe also makes makes a joke about the the novel that I mentioned before Melmoth the Wanderer by Charles Robert Maturin um in in a review which that which is about something completely different uh but but that that someone like Poe has has, um, has thought about uh, mm -hmm. a, a gothic a gothic novel like like right. Mammoth. Um and 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 so then I think that we can kind of um, and, and when when he writes when he when he in in the review when he mentions um, Melmoth, it's actually a it's actually a kind of reference to form mm -hmm. and and to Melmoth's this this kind of labyrinthine kind of et eternal labyrinthine structure um yeah. of this novel that that fails to finish um <laughs> itself in a lot of ways um and so so he does seem to be thinking about about irish gothic right in a mm -hmm. very kind of right. way right. um and um others as well there's a there's a american poet um in addition to poe um who i write about um a pro slavery south carolina uh, poet and and also um, a 
congressional representative from South Carolina, mm. this uh, William Grayson. And mm -hmm. um, he writes, um, he he writes a, a poem called The Hireling and the and the Slave. Um, and and I think and so in something like the hireling and the and the slave, I mean the the fact that that title uh, actually comes from the yeah. Star Spangled Banner yeah. is a particular kind of um, allusion to a kind to a sort of na national poetry, right? Mm -hmm. Like even even by the by the eighteen fifties. And that he's a that he's a that he's using that mm -hmm. th that kind of like specific illusion, but it's also the the case um, that in the um, preface uh, to the to the hireling and the slave, he actually uh, alludes to this uh, body of poetry um, mm -hmm. from from Irish history um, that had been attributed i mean there's actually a long and complicated history of forgery but um had been attributed uh to to the to the irish bard O'Sheen um or or ocean um and uh that 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 kind of illusion there seems to me to also suggest that that someone like grayson is in a way self-consciously putting his poem into dialogue mm -hmm. with a um a th this th this genre of of kind of what what something's called bardic nationalism mm -hmm. um that became really important in in Irish uh nationalist uh literature and Scottish as well um in in the late 18th century and 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 early 19th century some other times <laughs> uh it it seems to be imposed there's um there's a writer, there's, there's a novel I, I write about called The Garys and Their Friends, um, w which is um, by a Black American novelist uh, named, oh. named Frank Webb. Um, and um, in, in the 1850s. And um, one of the sort of... Um, it bo both dispiriting and also um, kind of eye rolling um, moments of, of 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 working on on web is re is reading the um, the British reviews um, of of his novel. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was published in it was published in England. It, it couldn't be published in the in the United States. And um, and the the only um, major um, American review was actually in in Frederick uh, Douglass's. Uh, journal, which was a reprint of a of a of an English review, um, but these these English reviewers um, again and again uh, keep, keep keep kind of like trying to pigeonhole what what Webb is doing into yeah. categories that they recognize. So so they okay. they they keep on kind of saying like he's like Dickens in this way, but not yeah. in that right or or right. he's read yeah. too much Thackeray, right or. <laughs> Um, and but again, and, sort of influencing each other and this uh, right in, in various ways or the assumption of a yeah. of a of a certain of a certain kind of influence. Um, yeah. There's a when I so that that book um, that novel the the Garys um, and their mm -hmm. friends, which I think is is a really amazing novel that everyone should read, um, yeah. has has a has an Irish character in it mm -hmm. um, named McCloskey. Um, and, um, he's a, he's a kind of, um, he's a sort of enforcer. He's a, he's a, he's a kind of brute, uh, character. Um, and, um, I actually came, I actually, uh, came to the Garys and, and their friends, um, after I had read and, and, and thought about Busico's, uh, mm -hmm. play, the, the Octoroon, um, which has a character named M McCloskey, um, as well. Um, who's also a kind, he's a, he's a sort of overseer of an estate, uh, in Louisiana and is, is a kind of brutal figure, uh -huh. um, although in a, in, in a somewhat different way than, than Webb's McCloskey. Um, and I have to admit when, you know, when we're thinking about kind of like lines of influence and, um, 
and how it goes. I have to admit, I mean, partly because I read um, the Octa Room before I read uh, the Garys and their friends, I I kind of assumed um, that the Boussicos play came first. Um, and that McCloskey mm -hmm. sort of like was, Cop you know, because copy, of Boussico, yeah. you know, was coming, yeah. you know, came into the sort of a, a American vernacular as, as this kind of figure. But in fact, Webb's novel is first. Um, mm -hmm. it, act it actually is the Black American writer um, who, 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 you know, I don't know. So I don't know yeah. whether, whether, you know, whether Boussico, whether there's any who copy to too, right? That, right. Well, well, certainly Webb didn't copy Boussico, right? right. Uh, yeah. so, so if anything, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's Webb who's, who's put this, mm -hmm. this, this kind of, a particular kind of like interesting understanding of right. the relationship of Irishness <laughs> to race, um, that then, and I, 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 I can't say that Boussico is intentionally, um, referring to 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 web, but um, but but that in a way, in in terms of how it gets into the air, how mm -hmm. it gets into mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, well, if you want a brutish Irish person, his name is McCloskey, right? Like, why not, right? right? right, right. Um, yeah. and that and that web seems to put that into circulation in a certain kind of way. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating. That's that's really interesting. Uh, how all this connects and interacts with one another. Um, but let's let's turn to <laughs> like turn to the race aspect. That I mean, it's in the title of your book, so it is an important part of of your story. And like, it sort of cuts two different ways, right? In part, there's sort of the aspect where you're talking about Irish as sort of being oftentimes presented or perceived or treated as a racial inferior people. But then there's the other aspect of slavery, chattel slavery, and sort of um, how people from Ireland interact with that, and especially individuals like John Mitchell or... Um, um, now I'm blanking on his name, going to Louisiana, right? So it's right. like... Busico, yeah. Busico. And it's like, <laughs> it's this kind of really... It seems like interconnected issue, right? Of sort of like, where do we belong in all of this? That kind of... Connects these two problems? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's right. Um, and I do think that that's important. And I do think that it is... Um, it's it's really complicated, and there's a uh -huh. there's a long and 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 complicated uh, history, um, and it is it is certainly the case um, that uh, I that that sort of a, that kind of like the 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 oppression um, of Ireland uh, from uh -huh. from from England, right? Like Mitchell's right, right about this, right? Um, is 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 longstanding and and yeah. is. Uh, it, and is um, brutal, and mm -hmm. and 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 certainly when a lot of these the writers that I'm um, looking at in the 1850s of all uh, decades, right, like in you know as in, in the aftermath of the yeah. uh, the Great Famine, um, um, they're they're sort of horrific, um, yeah. um, just you know degradation um, and discrimination and, mm -hmm. and and all and all kinds of all kinds yeah. of all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, the question the question of race was was um, in relationship to to Irishness and the way that we use the the mm -hmm. the language of race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, is is one that I think is um, part of the books. Um, sort of animating arguments. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm arguing against something that has become in some ways a commonplace in a lot of Irish studies or mm -hmm. or wanting to complicate the the commonplace um in in Irish uh, studies and 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 particularly in in um, strands of what's called Irish post-colonial studies. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the the idea that the Irish, when they came to the United States, uh, became white mm 
um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and sort of sort 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 of like um, um, you know. Right, it's a worked. character shames, right? Uh, yeah, like right. He, he yeah, going from this oppressed colonial person into into, and that, into and white that. into whiteness, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and and that whereas that they they weren't, um, and so they had to become white because they weren't right. white within the within the kind of like context of the yeah. of the of the, of the um, what what was the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this yeah. is, I mean, remember yeah. in the nineteenth century, right? Yeah. we're talking <laughs> about a time like after the Act of Union, mm -hmm. um, at the at the beginning of the century and before right. before yeah. Irish independence. So, um, um, so so there's um. And that's a really important uh, argument. It's an argument that that was sort of like especially um, given salience and and given a kind of language mm. by by an important scholar at the end of the uh, of the twentieth century named Noel Ignatieff um, with with his book called How, How the Irish Became White. Um, and then after this, this is the sort of like mm -hmm. you know the, the 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 kind of the argument. And Ign Ignatieff was 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 primarily an Americanist and he and he wanted to tell a story and I think he tells a really sort of important story mm -hmm. of the role of Irishness within American within the American racial regimes. I mean I really right. think it yeah. is a really important story. But there's a kind of in order to make his this yeah. kind of like overall argument work, he has to kind of like suggest that they weren't white before they got there. Uh right. right? Yeah. And then and then that that becomes a story. And that's that's yeah. where I want to like push push um back on. Yeah. Um well, and it's and, also so dependent on where you lived as an Irish person, where you lived in New York, where you were Irish, and that was indifference to English or Scottish or Germanness, or you were in the West, and sure, sure, right. we don't care. <laughs> you were right. white. It didn't you're matter where right. you came yeah. from. Yeah. Right. Or or when you're, if you're in the, the American um, South, um, I mean, there's, there's, right. yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. there's, an, there's, there's an assumption um, that, that people of Irish descent um, with within the enslaving American South were were largely not enslavers. They didn't have mm -hmm. the money, and to some extent, there were a lot of people who didn't have money, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, of course. right? And so, so there's there, but there's an assumption that that something like um, "Gone with the Wind," right, which is mm -hmm. written in the, right. in, yeah. the, in the in the early 20th century, but which is reflecting back on the on the you know, from the 1850s on um, through the Civil War and into Reconstruction, but um, there's an assumption that that's a kind of um, a sort of fantasy that there could be an Irish family um, mm -hmm. that 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 was an enslaving family um, right. on a plantation like Tara. Um, and of course, there were a, a lot yeah. of impoverished. Of um, there were a, a lot of impoverished um, uh, Ir people of Irish descent in in the American South um, right. in the eighteen in the eighteen fifties and, and 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 later. But but there are also actually a lot of people of Irish descent um, and even, you know, and Irish um, immigrants uh, to the United States who were enslavers. And, right. um, and that's, that's, I mean, again, my, my institution is, is Georgetown University and this, and we, over the past, you know, several, several yeah. years have yeah. had, have had a real sort of like accounting and, and a, a kind of call for accountability right. yeah. uh, um, of, of Georgetown because, um, in in the 1830s, um, Georgetown was able to um, continue in a way to exist as a college because of the sale um, of almost 300 right. human human beings um, right, right mm -hmm. in the, the um, into into the deeper south, um, yeah. and and that uh, that not the proud that, history, right? Yeah, that right, exactly. I mean that oh. that. The funds that were raised by wow. by the sale of human beings by not only by Jesuits but by Irish Jesuits, right? Um, yeah. right um, yeah. Is uh, is sort of like part of of what of of how how Georgetown remained solvent, right? In the, in the nineteenth century, right? So mm -hmm. so so like something something like that happened, right? And right. and that's that's. Yeah. Um, you know, so so that so that um, happened. Um, if if people um, uh, go to Charleston um, in in mm -hmm. South Carolina, um, there there is um, one of the um, sort of central names um, in Charleston in South Car Carolina um, in terms of um, the sale of human beings and the sale mm -hmm. of 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 chattelly enslaved uh, human beings is Ryan. 
Um, yeah. And and that's the, the, he's Irish, right? Yeah. So 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 it's not it's not in fact the case that um, there there were not e even in the the American South that that, that there were not Irish enslavers. Os Oscar Wilde's uncle. Um, right. was, yeah. was 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 an, yeah. an enslaver. Um, was a participant in the, um, yeah, in the, it's, sort of, it's, the Confederate Constitution. You know, right? it's, yeah. it's so easy. Like I, I remember giving a conference in um, Buderon in in Northwest Ireland, and like this one guy, I I talked about like my my research topic and kind of like how how these interpretations about like Irish status kind of influenced the way they looked at chattel slavery at the South. Mm -hmm. And the guy kind of was like, well, it's just because they lived in the South. It's all regional. And I was like, it's not all regional. It's uh, yeah. really dependent on like, like what, how, are, how willing are you to kind of embrace that culture yeah. of the yeah. region you're living in and whether you're yeah. willing to kind of stand against it too. Stand right? against like, it. I That's mean, right. John Mitchell yeah. starts in New York and then he moves to the South. Yeah, right. Yes. He, he finds it more interesting or, yeah, or kind of right. more, or, or, more right. welcoming as a more place. welcoming in a way, right? Yeah. And so so the, so I got really interested in this this kind of question, right? And mm -hmm. um and I got interested both in um well in, in two things. One in the um the the ways in which the 19th century Irish in Ireland, um, while absolutely oppressed, were not that their oppression was not necessarily, you know, was 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 uh -huh. understood racially in a certain kind of way, and that's uh -huh. really important, but what but did not make them equivalent to enslaved black people in the United States. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And so that that because right. they were right. understood, even though they were understood um as as in some ways degraded or, you know, right. in, yeah. in various ways, um, that 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 the that their that their whiteness was was largely sort of like a a foundation of yeah. of that that kind of understanding yeah. and and in fact uh, I mean Mitchell um, is a great example right but but um, but he's not the the only one um, of 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 Irish people making the argument mm -hmm. that that the oppression uh, th both that they are are sort of like treated as though they are black mm -hmm. um by the by the british government and mm -hmm. that this is especially bad because they're white right, right? and so that yes. double kind of move yeah. right yeah. like is the is the is the sort of um thing that i was uh you know kind of like interested in tracing there and right. there are there are some and, and this this notion of the kind of like um we were treat we're treated as though we're black, but it's especially bad because mm -hmm. we're white. Comes up again and again in the nineteenth century, and not only in not only in the United States mm -hmm. among among sort of like Irish Americans, but also in Ireland it, itself. Um, mm -hmm. There's, I mean, like um, there's a there was there's an earlyish quote, and it's actually not by um, not by an Irish guy, but it's about I Ireland. Um, but a quote that I find really interesting. So. Lord Byron, uh, the poet, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, the mm -hmm. poet that, yeah, yeah. that um, the sort of infamous, the controversial um, yeah. poet. The one who really stands out for the oppressed. You right, know, yes, right? a radical, yeah. right? Absolutely a radical. Um, yeah. and, um, and then, you know, and who, who, who dies fighting for, for Greek, Greek independence. independence. <laughs> right. Um, Can't be more romantic than that. Than that. Right? Um, so, um, in, in 1812, um, he's he's actually um, in the House of Lords, um, and and I think it's maybe his second speech in the House of Lords. So it's really early in his career, and it's on Catholic mm. emancipation. Mm. Wow. Um, and which is still so far that, away in, in many ways. Which is, which is still far yeah. away in many ways, right? And and of course, it's an interest. This interesting term, yeah. emancipation, right? And the yeah. kind of slippage between sort of like emancipation, um, in mm -hmm. in, in terms of of what what we right. call Catholic emancipation and right. um and emancipation of enslaved people, but um, but it's it's on Catholic emancipation. He's in support of it, of course, right? right. Yes. And um and um and he makes the argument, um that it, well he sort of makes the argument like look we we um in in britain 
um, abolished the Atlantic slave trade, right, mm -hmm. in, in 1807. Um, and he actually makes the, um, what I think sort of like bizarre argument um, that that Catholic emancipation is in some ways more pressing because the Catholic Irish have asked, have petitioned Parliament mm. for this, whereas mm. enslaved Black people never petitioned Parliament uh, apparently for, mm. uh, for 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 the abolishment of the enslaved trade, which is which is a bit hard when you're absurdity, enslaved. right? Right? Yeah. Well, it's well, you know, a bit hard when you're enslaved, but it's also not true. I mean, like right. uh, yeah. someone someone like Huguano um, at the end of the 18th century is absolutely right. yeah. of course uh, make, making the argument. Yeah. Um, so so um, so Byron. So so Byron said about our, uh, about Catholic emancipation, but 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 about Ireland um, in particular, and the kind of the um, the 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 kind of um, um, oppression in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, he he says, for myself, I pity the Catholic peasantry for not having the good fortune to be born black. <laughs> it's an astonishing quotation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... right. It's an astonishing like, sort quotation. Sort of like saying but, that if you were black, you would have a lot more abilities you, yeah, to. Yes, you know. that's right. Because, because Parliament is going to come and abolish the slave, you know, the Atlantic slave yeah. trade without you yeah. even having to ask for it. But here, yeah. and right, you're like it's even, and fighting, it's even and you're worse, not and you're not going anywhere, and it's even right. Mm -hmm. the, this kind of, this kind of, this kind of association. This, what, what I think, I mean, in a way, I mean, again, Byron is a radical. Mm -hmm. By, Byron is. Yeah. Byron, he's making this argument in what he thinks is a kind of way of freeing people, right? right? But that, but that he could so easily slip into this notion that it's even worse, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Which is not to, right, right? It's, it's, um, it's sort of like Southerners saying we're enslaved people because we can't take our human property everywhere in the country, everywhere right, right? exactly like... right yes right exactly i mean so and then daniel o'connell another amazing voice yeah, in yeah. um in, here in in ireland um both um for for sort of like catholic enfranchisement right. but but for the abolition of slavery as well i mean he was yeah. really really important in that and that mm -hmm. leads to you know or it's or it's it's one of the things that really leads to 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 um to sort of Mitchell's um disavowal of of yeah. of, of O'Connell, um, but in but um so so again a, a guy that I have you know in a lot of ways mm -hmm. you know you want to have a tremendous amount of respect for, um, he in eighteen fourteen he makes the argument about how things haven't gotten better, right? Mm -hmm. Like things haven't gotten better in Ireland, right. um, and he says I flattered myself. That we that we that is the the sort of the Irish or the Catholic mm -hmm. Irish had had risen in in Protestants estimation. He said, I did imagine we had ceased to be whitewashed blacks and had thrown off for seen. them for the Protest for the Protestants all traces mm -hmm. of the color of servitude. But this correspondence has, I confess, done away with the delusion. And and what you keep on seeing mm -hmm. here is is ways in which people arguing mm -hmm. for Irish rights right. are using the language of race mm -hmm. and they're using the language of, of blackness as a kind of thing that in some ways marks it's it's a kind of metaphor mm -hmm. for ultimate degradation yeah. and for, and ultimate oppression. Yeah. But also um for these people marks in some ways the reason that this group of people deserves not to be that mm -hmm. the irish deserve not to be that yeah. because we are not whitewashed black people right yeah. right yeah. right right we are whites and right and that's and that's sort of like part of the argument that's that's there yeah um, it's, it's it's kind of so interesting because we we kind of both look at the same kind of material from set from very different angles because it's sort of like you're looking at it's like they're they're kind of like you want to want to argue against this notion of like irish as black and i actually read these doc documents in a very different way and in, in that and this sort of the historian versus literary critic right which we can nicely illustrate yeah, here yeah, I, yeah. I read these in sort of sensing saying like 
their thinking of themselves as enslaved people, politically yeah. enslaved by the it's British. Like it, right, yes. You know, and, and, so, and so they a, use it as a metaphor, right? Yeah, So exactly. that they draw upon it as a metaphor. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting, I mean, this is now from the 1840s, but the nation, the great nationalist mm -hmm. yeah, Irish yeah, journal. Big paper. Right, yeah, really important um, paper. And, and, and right, uh, and, you know, has 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 the has the Mitchell connection as well. Mm -hmm. Um but um that that the in 1847 the nation is arguing against Irish people mm -hmm. and this isn't the American nation. So this is important for listeners, right? Because right, there's right, also right, the yeah, American yeah. right there's there's the journal in the United yep. States, which is the nation, right? But this is the the Irish one. Um and um and they uh they're arguing against Irish people um throwing their support um in a kind of like public or collective mm -hmm. way toward toward abolition right. um um i mean whatever individuals do right the individuals do and and they they and and they they kind of like again i mean you're absolutely they draw the connection mm -hmm. and then draw the line between it yeah right that's yeah. the kind of thing you draw the connection draw the line between it. they they're right we have really so very urgent affairs at home yeah. So much abolition of white slavery to affect, if we mm -hmm. can, that all our exertions will be needed in Ireland. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing, right? Like, yeah. So draw the connection, then draw the line. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and, so, so, and so one of the figures in the book um, that's a that's a really, I think, a just a major kind of thinker, a 19th century thinker. Um, that I've learned a tremendous amount from, um, I would have to say, and that is in some ways the, the 19th century writer and, and thinker who has provided me with, for me, the most kind of like powerful ways of thinking both about connections, but then also the importance of, of differences is Frederick Douglass. Um, Frederick uh -huh. Douglass right. went to Ireland. Frederick right. Douglass toured in Ireland um uh his his um uh his, his book sold well in Ireland um he he met with with abolitionists in 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 Ireland um F Frederick Frederick Douglass um has has you know one of those the sort of like you know fa famous you know famous sort of like shock um of 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 John Mitchell's mm -hmm. um um sort um uh, enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, for the American mm -hmm. for the American slave system um when when someone like Douglas would have expected that 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 Mitchell um, right. would would be on the side of abolition right um, and it's sometimes so fascinating when these people that everyone expect to be in favor of something end up on the and other they're side not, right? right yeah like yeah D yeah Douglas is is just you know shocked I, yeah. I think at this right and then but um Douglas is when Douglas is doing the um lecture tour in 1845 I think um in in Ireland mm -hmm. one of the things that keeps on happening mm -hmm. um is is that I mean, it, it, and I want, and, and it's important, right? Like, like, uh -huh. like, um, the Irish took to this, right? Like, they came to yeah. these. There was enthusiasm, right? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, um, f for it, he, um, Douglas, uh, s s sort of, um, I, I'd say proudly, right, right, uh -huh. you know, wrote, wrote, wrote back, back to the states that, the, you know, that he was dubbed the Black O'Connell um, <laughs> of the United States, um, and uh, for his oratory, for his rhetoric, yeah, for the yeah. power of his words, yeah. right? Um, well, that's something very big for the Irish. That and that's that something oratory, really big. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um. So, so, but one of the things that 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 keeps on happening, right? And it doesn't just happen once, but happens repeatedly. Is that enthusiastic Irish people come come up to him um, after mm -hmm. his after his talks and and sort of you know thank him. Thank him for it, for mm -hmm. it, and and say this this is really important to us because we are also enslaved, right? And, and Douglas has to keep saying again and again, he's 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 saying he says, mm -hmm. look, I am against all oppression, mm -hmm. and so I'm absolutely against the oppression that the Irish that you Irish people are facing right. within the United within the United Kingdom. Right. That yeah, is right. absolutely true. Mm -hmm. But you are not enslaved. Yeah. 
because and because there's a difference mm -hmm. between what's happening here right. and what's happening in in the United right. States. Yeah. For as oppressed as you are, there's still rights, right. argues right. Yeah, right. But there's a kind of sense that there's that there is, yeah, there, 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 there's a kind of like sense that there is a human being who right, who, yeah. who who can who dignity. can who can who can enter into contracts yeah. right who can yeah. right uh, you know who can um who who can who can bring mm -hmm. um you know uh, lawsuits right or right, you know, yeah, something, yeah. right you know yeah. something like that right and and, and At least you there's can get a, a trial yeah right yeah you know there's there's an ownership of the self mm -hmm. even if there's political oppression there's a there's a right. kind of sense of an ownership of the self and Douglas says that that is what has been robbed from us Mm -hmm. from from black people in the united states um is that we are we are um right we, no. like our, our, our we've been taken away and so and so for me i think that, that this was really powerful for me mm -hmm. for sort of thinking about like yes douglas does douglas says and, he, and he, you know he, he sort of says like there are kind of like there are rhymes mm -hmm. across the atlantic between these situations but they are not analogous Mm -hmm. And th and that kind of like there are rhymes to bring another right. literary term, right? Yeah. There's something yeah. that rhymes, right? But it's, but it's not, not an, it's not the same. Yeah. Um. And that and that Douglas keeps on saying that, and that's one of the things in this book that was really important to me mm -hmm. was was to say as as much as like whenever we're we're writing about kind of like oppression, um, violence, mm -hmm. um, colonial brutality. Um, economic yeah. right, yeah. Br right brutality yeah. the famine mm -hmm. um t uh, right uh, transportation um yeah. indentured servitude right i mean like there's all kinds of things that we, that, that we can write about um and and think about it in this absolutely true in terms of irish precarity in terms of irish suffering in terms of the violence of irish history but that i think that we need to be really careful about um I, I think that we that we need that we need to respect, for me anyway, both as a kind of like, you know, a thinker, a scholar, mm -hmm. but actually to you know to the extent that I'm any kind of right. you know literary historian, cultural historian, right? I think that we need to respect the kind of uniqueness, um, of of black experience of of mm -hmm. of black dispossession, yeah. um, and of black resilience, and and that whenever we're wanting to um kind of like coalition built which is mm -hmm. someone something that that both someone like o'connell and um and and uh, douglas are really um interested in in doing in the 19th century mm -hmm. but, but that when whenever we want a coalition build we have to kind of like recognize that that coalition does not mean um does not mean that it's exact that that the histories are exactly the same mm -hmm. right? right that's yeah. a coalition across difference right. Right. um and i and it's my sense that that's um that douglas understands that yeah um yeah. and and that he makes he makes, makes the point and well and for the um, irish it's the argument of political extingency right that it's like oh this this works for us because we can create sympathy and yes relate that's to right. another right. cause right. that's right Ab absolutely right yeah it's a it's about kind of like it, it, it's in it's in a way using this this kind of um right. language in order to yeah, yeah right yeah to 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 kind of say look it it is like this thing and if you think yeah. that thing is bad you should you should think yeah. you should yeah. think this thing is bad um and it's, I, I mean, it's sort of like i was thinking like it's pretty easy when when like you have the similar language like plantations in ireland plantations in north america that's right, right? emancipation and, yeah, emancipation, right. yeah, yeah. like abolition or Abol like, right, yeah. like liberator and right. all these terminologies yeah. that they kind of well, come up with. Yeah, well, and and the and the language of slavery, right? Which right, yeah. which which the which the Irish um very um, much embrace. You very much themselves. embrace for themselves, yeah. right? You know, um um Thomas More, the the poet mm -hmm. I mentioned before that Poe was, yeah. you know, reading and thinking about, you know, Th Thomas More you know, yeah. writes um, around 1840, born of Catholic parents. I came yeah. in, I come into the world with a slave's yoke around my neck. And it's like, yeah. well, 
No, not quite, no, not, re- no. not really quite, right? You know, yeah. um, and that those different those those differences those differences mm-hmm. really really matter, and I think they what? matter. I think they matter in the other way also. I mean, one of the ways in which it's not only from the kind of like pro Irish side, although that's what we've been talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, no, the Byrons and the O'Connells and and the Mitchells for that, you know, yeah. for that matter, um, uh, from the pro Irish side, but also. Um, it is it is absolutely the the case that um caricaturists for example mm-hmm. in, in 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 both the united kingdom and the united states um um caricature irishness in a in a kind of racialized right. way yeah. Yeah. um kind of often, the way they're drawing it right mm-hmm. well and you know, there's the famous in the in the united states right there's the, there's the famous um um uh, nast uh drawn yeah. from yeah, you know exactly. uh, yeah, from, from harper's right mm-hmm. with the with the with the scales um the kind of reconstruction era with the scales um of a of a, a, a kind of like balancing out and so the black yeah. vote and the and the irish yeah. voter are, are balancing themselves out and yeah. this is this is something that's sort of been said like look these two faces are looking at each other look there's a kind of there's a line there's a connection yeah. that's being drawn yeah. um between between these two caricatures these two mm-hmm. kind of like racial caricatures one of the things yeah. that it's that's that's often ignored about this thing is that NAS is actually drawn underneath it black and white. Like the, the, right. the point the, the point is yes, that that white that that that, that the Irish are white and that they yeah. are kind of problematic, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, within exactly. a kind of like politics and yeah. and the so, difficulty and so, of the contemporaries even muddying the waters, right? The waters, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So so there are, you know, there yeah. are a number of caricatures. Um, especially in the in the London-based journal mm-hmm. um, Punch um, in the in the mid in the in the mid nineteenth uh, century, mm-hmm. um, the car- the caricature Irish people, especially working class Irish people, mm-hmm. or or um, or activists or Fenian yeah. activists, right? Um, with, with kind of these kind of like racialized, um, mm-hmm. what's often called so sort of simianized, they look kind of like monkeys. Um, these these images, but one of the things that that struck and, and and so there's that line right mm-hmm. uh, you know that connect right but one of the things that struck me um about those images is that in general in the 19th century the way that the character works is that it's insulting it it it, it thinks that it, it wants to be insulting irish people to suggest by yeah. suggesting that they are similar in some way to racist yeah. caricatures of black people, yeah. right? So, yeah. so the in, so the insult to the Irish, mm-hmm. so, so, so that the way that this, the, these, these are not images that mm-hmm. th- these images are assuming the racist yeah. caricature of black people, mm-hmm. and then, and then insulting the Irish <laughs> by being like that caricature, right. yeah, right, because the Irish. The Irish, in a way, there are being insulted because, in a way, they have whiteness to lose by yeah, being yeah. brought into this. Yeah. And they kind of bring it like they they kind of making these arguments that they are like different, oppressed, kind of like that opens the door to it almost. To too. Al- almost, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's a there, yeah. There's a there's a what's become in Irish studies a sort of famous quotation from a letter. By by the novelist and author uh, um, uh, Charles Kingsley, and he's he's traveling um, he's traveling around around um, Ireland, um, and he and he and um, he writes back to his wife um, there, and he's in County Sligo, um, hmm. so so in the west, oh, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, and he writes, he writes, um, and this, this quote becomes very kind of, this becomes the kind of like, oh, look, the Irish are understood as though they are like people of African descent because the same kind of like racist terms are used for them. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he, he says, I'm haunted by the human chimpanzees I saw along that hundred miles of horrible country to see white chimpanzees is dreadful. If they Mm -hmm. were black, one would not feel it so much. But their skins, except where tanned by exposure, are as white as ours. And and this this is one yeah, of these yeah. kind of like quotes yeah. that's often used to say, look, yeah. there's a connection, right? Mm-hmm. This kind of like racist yeah. terminology is the same is a similar mm-hmm. racist terminology. But yeah. what strikes me kind of like, and it's absolutely, yeah, there's there's that connection. But what strikes me is like the next line is, and why this is especially horrible is because they are white. <laughs> 
Right, and right, and right. if they were black, it would not feel as Reasonable. horrible. And it's mm-hmm. like total um, racism right there. Total racism right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh it's crazy. And in part, as as we're kind of talking about it all, I kind of like the more the more you think about it, right? The more like this this argument of yours is is important, is essential because there's like all these white southerners who are kind of like, no, no, no. Like today, right? They they're yeah. saying like, no, no, no. Today, oh, African Americans weren't the first slaves. So Irish were the first slaves yeah. to come into yeah. America, and you're kind of like, no, no, no that, that that doesn't work, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. And, and I think in that that's that argument you're making is very important to kind of go against these sort of notions. Like, yes, of course, at the time people truly like bought into it because they kind of wanted to draw connections to their oppression but it's yeah it creates a false it creates a false analogy between yeah. the irish situation and what african americans yeah. in the south experience yeah there's a there's a um there's a phrase that i found um really um really really powerful um um and um it it comes from a a a scholar um and 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 writer um named frank wilderson um and and he uses the he uses the phrase uh, the ruse of analogy um and i think that's it's like really yeah. powerful and it's yeah. like it's like it's kind of like what i was sort of like um thinking about um in this book and so it's, he's another kind of like really important a uh, scholar of color, right? Who's mm-hmm. who I think that we should be kind of like reading and thinking about, yeah. um, and and that the way that a now that that and this is this is related to like this is how I come in some ways, you know. Mm-hmm. I owe this to Wilderson um, that I come to this kind of like argument about genre because genre creates analogies, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the way that yeah. genre works, right? Like we yeah. we recognize something as a sonnet not mm-hmm. because the sonnet is something that was given at the beginning of time by God or something like that, but because it has some kind of analogous features Mm -hmm. to something else that we've understood as a sonnet. Right. And so that the way that the genre works is, is through analogy. And, Mm -hmm. but, but Wilderson makes what, what I think is, is just this excellent point that that analogy also deceives analogy is a ruse. Mm -hmm. Analogy is a, can be a kind of trap that, That we right. that we start to um, assume we, that we that that the analogy starts to um, make us think that things are equivalent or the same um, when right. when they when they or may not, not be yeah. when, when, right. when they might not be um, and he he in that section where he I mean he uses the the term of right. analogy a couple of times but in one of those sections he talks specifically. Um, about what he calls the grammar of black suffering. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that that's also just so kind of like powerful, right? That, right. that it's, it's that we, we need to, um, we need to be really careful about um, appropriating the, mm-hmm. and I, I, I mean, from yeah. my perspective, I love, I love the fact that he's using the language of grammar, right? He's using the right, language right. Of, <laughs> of, of, of language there, but, but kind of like, we need to be really careful of appropriating mm-hmm. the structures of, of yeah. someone else's history um, yeah. and, yeah. and, 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 and someone else's suffering and, and I, you know, and also someone else's resilience yeah, um, and, exactly. and someone else's, you know, right. Um, and it doesn't so take I, away from your suffering. It just means we have right. to take a. Di- we have to use a different language. We have to use to a different language, or be really or, right. Absolutely, and yeah. and 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 I think that. So I mean, to your to your point um, about now, um, I think that for me this was, um, you know, as I was, I was writing this this book, I I th- this was a kind of way in which I I was writing this book in a in a kind of. Uh, almost like a fugue state of of a kind of horror at the ways mm-hmm. in which Irish precarity was was being mobilized, um, right, right, like yeah, now, yeah, right in our yeah. in our own our own time, um, mm-hmm. by by far right groups, um, yeah. in order, in in actually in the service of anti black racism, right, mm-hmm. like actually actually deploying right. Irish precarity 
um, right. specifically um, in the service of yeah, anti-black racism. Yeah, they'll play African American yeah. suffering, right? The suffering, like, oh, right? The Irish yeah. were the same. So why are right. you? Yeah. Complaining? Why are you right? right? I mean, right? Yeah, and, and it goes, it goes. I mean, this goes back to Mitchell, right? This is a nineteenth yeah. century yeah. sort of like, <laughs> sort of like um, connection, right? And so I was oh, kind of like, uh, right, uh, thinking about that and. But yeah. one of the things I also wanted to also thought about, and I think is really important, is that I do think that in in this kind of post-colonial Irish, there's 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 there is really good and influential and powerful mm -hmm. post-colonial Irish studies scholarship of the mm -hmm. 1980s and 1990s that is is asking these questions, is mm -hmm. is asking the kind of the questions of the relationship. Um, between um um blackness and and, and irishness um in the 19th mm -hmm. century or in the 18th century and um you know so, you know some some of these are these are great you know uh Nola Knotiev is is one of these the theodore mm -hmm. allen um is is um an, another one of of them um david rodiger the great labor historian mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. is a is another one of them in an incredibly i think thoughtful and nuanced way right like I, right. I i really think that he's doing sort of like fantastic work and um as as well as a lot of kind of like post-colonial irish studies mm -hmm. folk um and and so i i don't want to discount the the importance mm -hmm. of that work and in and in particular what i don't want to discount is that what that work opens up, um, mm -hmm. as well as the the work of of others, some someone someone like um, Nell Irvin Painter, the the the, the historian, mm -hmm. um, um, open opens up, is is sort of like thinking about whiteness as itself having a a, a history and being constructed rather than being simply the mm -hmm. the norm against right. which otherness racial otherness is measured right like right. whiteness yeah. doesn't you know there's a there's a certain kind of way in which whiteness is sometimes understood as not as 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 just being the the standard against mm -hmm. which di you know difference is is measured and yeah. i think that 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 a lot of these um the 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 post colonial irish studies uh scholars uh the labor scholars um, all you know, working in these topics in the in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, um, um, the 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 historians of whiteness like Painter mm -hmm. um, um, are, are did, did incredibly important work right. in opening up that question, yeah. right? Um, in 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 doing that, but um, what I what I was thinking about is you know as I was reading writing this book at this at this time and though and 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 now is that i is that i feel that 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 we need in a way to um we need to build on that and to kind mm -hmm. of like kind of like find the differences as well as the coalitions and the similarities yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and stuff like that um and and kind of like have a wake up call to those of us mm -hmm. who are in the academy and who care about racial justice mm -hmm. um to to for, for us now um, to stop making our own kind of like somewhat under theorized equivalencies, right. Mm -hmm. Between the experiences yeah. of, of Irish people and those of black people, yeah. even if, yeah. even if the equivalencies are well intended. Right. right. And that yeah. we, we need to kind of like think about now, like in the world that we are now, mm -hmm. um, not, not erasing or, or, or eliminating or, or or canceling, right? You know, this kind of like important work that 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 has come before us. Um, but to figure out ways of building coalitions yeah. for justice yeah. across race mm -hmm. without erasing the specificity of black experience through right. through yeah. analogy. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Ooh. <laughs> We have been at it about an hour and a half now, so yeah. Well, thank you. This has been a, sorry. This is a great conversation. Um, you know, yeah, and like I really appreciate all of your questions. It's very enlightening. I'm kind of like, like looking at my talking points. I think you you kind of covered like on your own without me even kind of trying to direct you in most of those. <laughs> well, I, I really, I, another. I, re I really appreciate that kind of questions. I, I really appreciate. No, it, it's very the, interesting. And, I, I mean, appreciate that you've read the book and thought about the book. <laughs> yeah, no, like as as once you got like like 
for me, of course, John Mitchell was the most interesting part because I, I have written about John Mitchell myself and kind of I for me, it was more sort of like understanding, like, where does this racism come from? Like yeah. the little experience he has with it, right? Like it's only in right. Brazil that he sees slavery right. before he comes to the United States. So like, how does he turn this racist attitude <laughs> on right right and so it's 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 very interesting like i find it very interesting and like i i really like talking to you and kind of like reading the book it kind of really kind of forced me to kind of even think about my own work and kind of be like hmm there are a couple of things i probably should have done a little differently now well but that's always the way we learn from each other yeah yeah thank you i really appreciate that it's all the kind um and and um if it can have, you know, if my book can have some small effect in the world that I, you know, I'm grateful for that. But, but I do think, um, I mean, I'd say from, right, as, as you said, and, and from where we started the conversation, like where, where this book come from, I mean, in a lot of ways, this book came out of something that I was writing about and publishing on that, right. um, that, that I started to feel that I was doing wrong in some yeah. in, in some kind of like kind of important way to to sort of wrestle with and yeah. that um and and that that i mean it's always right mistake. we write yeah. something because we we feel that there's something that we can contribute to the understanding of the world that has both meaning in its, in its time that we write about but also in the time that we live in that's, that we're living in that's right that's you know, right it's this, it's this duality of right like like i look at my work and i'm like I, I i want to understand why the world is so interconnected how people are interacting with one another but right. then also to remind people today when we're like Oh, globalization is something new, or like this exchange of ideas is something <laughs> so new and alien and hot and dangerous for us. And you're like, no, no, it, it's always been there. It's just it's different. It's a little different today. It's a little and, different. And and from my perspective, I mean, like, and this is, I mean, to go back to also your question from the beginning about about method. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think and historians obviously do this also, but I think that one of the things that we are sort of like hyper conscious of as as literary critics is when we are thinking about both connections Mm -hmm. between the present and the past but also differences one of the things that we're kind of obsessed with or look Mm -hmm. at and wrestle with is uh, is language right and 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 the ways the ways in which language matters to Mm -hmm. the way that we understand stand um painter has a great article from the guardian so sort of like public facing journalism Mm -hmm. with a with it with a headline that's the way that we think about the word enslaved matters Mm -hmm. and i think that 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 is super important and she's absolutely Mm -hmm. right um that we that that we need to be you know we need to think about our language but we also it's about sort of unpacking the way that language shapes mm-hmm. how how we think and how they thought yeah. and how we think yeah. about them and how they would have yeah. thought about their future, right? right. And so, like we yeah. tell students all the time, word choice matters. Word choice matters, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and that's the right the word about. is such an important choice. When yes, we use the wrong word; it sends a completely different meaning. Or that's right. Overplay something or underplay something. So. But in this, like, uh, again, Patrick, thank you so much for joining me tonight or this morning for you. Uh, again, if you're interested in, if we kind of whet your appetite and you you need a Guinness to go with a good book, um, Patrick's book is The Irish and the Imagination of Race, White Supremacy Across the Atlantic in the 19th Century. And you can get the book from the University of Virginia Press if you are interested. Um, again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for talking with me and for inviting me on. And thank you to, to people listening. Um, so thanks.